Hello everyone, welcome to the first video where we don't talk about tech and we talk about ethic and ownership. Even though it's not tech related, I believe this chapter is extremely important, not just for your A-level exam, but beyond your A-level career, if you choose to be a software engineer or a IT person. This is the different topic that we'll be co covering. So let's first define what is ethic. Ethic can be defined as a set of moral principles that guides us to distinguish right from wrong and determine appropriate conduct. Of course, for different people, the line between right and wrong can be very different. So what is right can be considered from one of the following viewpoints, philosophical, religious, legal, or pragmatic. So I want to talk specifically on the ethic for IT professionals. And one example of it is this, the very long name, ECM Joint Task Force Software Engineering Code of Conduct. And it's in this code of conduct here, there are eight ma main sections, which I think are extremely important for software engineer. They are public. Every software engineer should act consistently with public interest. Client and employers, they should be loyal and beneficial to, the employer should be beneficial and loyal to the client. Management, everything that can that is done has to be consistent with the law policy and standards and software engineers should be fair and supportive to their colleague product it has to abide highest professional standard the judgment it has to produce highest quality work and the professional has to advance the integrity and reputation of that profession and as for the software engineer him or herself they have to continuously enhance their professional development. For some of you may, might think that, well, this is common sense. Yet having this conduct in mind will really make the world a better place. So an example of how a software engineer that is developing an application for a healthcare company that stores sensitive patient data, how he or she can apply this code of conduct. So for the public, it has to ensure that the app abide the privacy regulation. You cannot just share data to other people. Being transparent and honest about the application. If something went wrong, you have to say it out. Management, abide all the relevant laws and regulation. Collaborate with your colleague. Produce a high quality application instead of a half done work. Ensure security and privacy of patient data. Ensure that you also have a professional con community and the software engineer should seek professional development just to make the app better. So this is an example of how a computing professional can apply this code of conduct. We have talked about public good, but let's define it. Understanding it will help you to create products that will benefit the society as a whole. So it is in product development or project initiation refers to creating solution that serve broader community welfare, addressing critical needs and adhering to ethical and legal standards for the betterment of society. In the past, I will just show you some examples when projects really didn't take public good into consideration. The first one is healthcare.gov government. The initial launch of it encountered significant technical issues. And this led to a lot of money being wasted. Here it says hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. So this incident highlighted the importance of meticulously planning and testing and implementation of large scale public project. Because it is a public project, it's using the people's money. So if as a software engineer, you don't plan properly, you don't uphold highest professional standard, this might mean that a lot of monies are, are being wasted. Second one is the Defense Integrated Military Human Resource System. Basically, it's a system that tried to integrate multiple military personnel and pay system into a single platform. And yet the project was terminated again, if else, after spending approximately $1 billion. Just think about it, if the software engineer did a proper job, then this $1 billion would have been worth it, all right? If they found out that they cannot do it, they should have spent it in other areas to improve people's life. 
So this is some of the public concern about nature of an endeavor. So if you want to do something for your government, for the public, um, something that need to take into consideration, which is some influential corporation might use that leverage over a smaller company to achieve, let's say, monopoly and firm offering system with no assurance of protection against unauthorized entry. Entities attempt to hide details of a security breach. They don't let you know that their system has been hacked, etc. Personal information, transmission of offensive or unlawful material, <coughs> and content accuracy, which is when a lot of fake news happen. But how do we control that? And if a lot of fake news uh, being consumed by the public, is that good for the society? So this chapter is relatively uh, philosophical, but bear with me. Ownership and copyright. So the next top topic. So copyright provides exclusive legal right to creator over their original right, meaning if they create this thing, they should have the right to decide when to share and when not to share it. Same goes to organization. That means other people should not distribute it <coughs> without um, given permission. So some example of creation that can be copyrighted an article you cannot just copy the entire article since write your name at the bottom <laughs> that would be plagiarism firm youtube videos like the one i'm making now computer programs music so why copyright access this is important if you have been downloading private pub uh pirate stuff then let's study why you shouldn't do it protection from unauthorized use so that uh, the we don't use something that other people have created without permission. The second thing why this is important is also to provide economic reward for creativity, to create something like a software video that I'm making now, articles, they requires a lot of time. And if you think about it, time is basically someone's life. They, they use spend their life to create it. So they should get reward. This is why copyright exists. One example all right, of typical copyright law is something like that. A mandatory registration stipulating the work creation date, which means if you want this creation to be copyrighted, you have to register it. A specific time frame during which copyright protection remains applicable. An established protocol for handling the copyright of an individual in the event of their dismiss. A standardized approach for indicating copyright, such as the utilization of the X symbol. So usage of copyrighted work. This is an example. So I used some music in my YouTube videos recently, but I canceled it. But then since they allowed me to use it, this is the only thing they require me to do. They asked me to write down, to credit them basically. So this is one example of how we can use copyrighted work by obeying to what they want us to do. So these are copyright, and let's look into the different types of software licensing. So if you were to create a software using codes in the future, you might want to decide how your software can be distributed. So the first type of software is called commercial software, meaning you give the customer the right to use your software provided that they pay you a fee, but they do not own the software. So this is a screenshot I taken from the App Store, and these are the top eight paid apps. So you can see I purchased Final Cut Pro already. And different payment option for a commercial software is either you buy a one-time purchase, it's just pay, and then you you can use it forever. Subscription based like YouTube Premium, where you have to pay every month. Educational pricing, which is something that I am using now because I'm an educator, for Canva. Per user licensing, basically if my school want to purchase this software for a group of teachers, then my school will have to pay for each of the teacher that uses the software. So that's per user licensing. The other type of software is shareware and freeware. Software shareware is distributed on a trial basis, often allowing limited use before requiring payment. Think of it like a trial program that gives you a trial to use it. And if you like it, you pay. If not, then you can't use it anymore. Whereas freeware is distributed free of charge, so it can distribute it without any time limit. Great. Condition when we need to use a commercial software, trial period assessment, shareware allow users to evaluate 
the software capability before committing to purchase, meaning we try it out first, enabling informed decision about its suitability for specific business purposes. Cost-effective solution, freeware provides users useful tools and application at no cost, making it attractive option for individuals or organizations with limited budgets. Functionality, the software is available for immediate use and provide the functionality required. So the other type of software is what we call open source software, which means refers to computer software with a thought could have made available and licensed, typically under a license allowing student to sorry users to study, change and distribute for anyone and for any purpose. They are not created to make a profit. This is an example. Free Software Foundation is a non-profit with a worldwide mission to promote computer user freedom. So if you can see here, this is something I screenshot. Free software means the user have the freedom to run, edit, contribute to, and share the software. So this is typically done by the non-profit. And another term in your syllabus is called copyleft. That's another type of um, term pre pre defined by Free Software Foundation is that you can use the software given, provided that you give the same freedom to others when you have made some modification to it. So that's copyleft, the opposite of copyright. So condition to use uh, an open source software is cost effective. All right, you don't have to pay for anything. Customization and flexibility, you can edit it for your own use. Community support and collaboration. So different people, all around the world, they can contribute to a single project. So that's the collaboration part of it. So the last part of ethic that I want to talk about is artificial intelligence, which is on a trend recently. And But before that, let's look into what an AI can do now. So generate AI known as artificial generate intelligence, refer to AI system or machine with human-like cognitive abilities. As I will show you later, what is something that they can do which human can do too. Problem solving. The cognitive process of identifying, resolving issue, obstacle to achieve a specific goal. For example, AI can use algorithm to help the rider to find the, mo the nearest path to deliver the product. And a hospital can use statistical model to identify pattern and healthcare pattern and optimize patient treatment trend. So this is something in the past can only be done by human, but then they cannot be done by AI. AI. Another one is linguistic, voice identification and vocal replication methods. So one example that I want to use is called Speechify. Basically, they are a software that takes in a PDF or any reading documents and then translate the words into voice. And as you can see, there are different people's voice here. So these are made and able by artificial intelligence. Check this out if you are interested. It's called Speechify. Another one is perception, to interpret and understand sensory information from the environment. So for example, Amazon Robot AI that is used in the warehouse, they can move without controller. They can move themselves. Tesla self-driving car. Another thing they can do is reasoning. Exact example, analyze historical data to predict market trends and make informed investment decision in financial trading. Learning, one of it is that they can take in a bunch of emails, and then if human were to categorize them into spam, over time, the computer can also categorize this email as spam. Machine learning models, and they also use an e-commerce website to know what you sh will likely buy next. So this is also done by artificial intelligence. They learn what you like and dislike. So the last slide of today, what are some of the negative impact of AI? Because it's related to ethic. So insufficient data protection by company can lead to potential misuse, breaches, and authorized access. Meaning if we don't have strict law to regulate data access, then your, da your data and my data could be compromised, could be shared by anyone in the world. AI advancement may also lead to unemployment. This is pretty uh, normal, meaning AI just take over the job of a human, like the Amazon robot that I show you in the warehouse. Potential AI errors or system failures can result in car accidents. So what if the computer did something wrong in calculation? So in the past, if 
an accident happened, we know who could accuse, but for now it's an AI. Do we accuse the AI? So that's something to think about. Robot manufacturing can also result in environmental impact. AI increasing capability may eventually replace certain experts. So this raised concern and question about, you know, whether are we creating a tool to benefit humans or are we just creating this to replace human entirely? So this is all about ethic. If you're watch until here, thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you have any thoughts in the comment section and I'll be happy to answer it. Goodbye.